18. Does sugar accelerate the life process and death too? Sugar's effect on growth. Laboratory animals that are used to test diets are invariably weighed regularly, at least once a week. Almost everyone, therefore, who has looked at the effects of feeding sugar has obtained information about what this does to the rate at which the animals gain or lose weight. Sometimes an experiment also measures how much food the animals eat. In this way, Research workers may be able to show that animals utilize their food with varying efficiency, eating the same amount of different diets, for instance, but gaining less weight with one diet than with another. Sometimes too, but much less frequently, they not only weigh the animals, but actually determine the composition of their bodies. By measuring how much fat and how much lean an animal has in its body, the research workers may find two diets that seem to result in the same gain of weight but yield a different proportion of fat and lean. Most workers have reported that sugar-rich diets result in a slower gain in weight in young rats, young chickens, and young pigs. When they measure the amount of food the animals eat, it often turns out that those on the sugar diet gain less weight for each 100 grams of food and when they look at the composition of the bodies of the animals, they sometimes find more fat and sometimes less. Here are some examples. Male rats fed for six months from the age of six weeks weighed about 410 grams when we fed them without sugar. With sugar, they weighed only about 380 grams. The effect was more noticeable when the diets were rather low in protein. The rats then reached a weight of 320 grams when they had no sugar, but 270 grams with sugar. As I pointed out in the previous chapter, this was because the sugar reduced the body's utilization of the protein in the diet. In an earlier experiment with chickens, some American workers showed that sugar had no effect on the weight when protein was adequate, but did reduce the weight gain when the protein was not quite adequate. However, the question has been raised whether, in the affluent countries where protein is adequate, the accompanying intake of sugar causes an increase in growth. The most active and enthusiastic proponent of this idea is Dr. Eugen Ziegler of Switzerland. In a number of remarkably detailed and forcefully argued publications, he drew attention to statistics from many countries of birth weight, of height and weight of children, and of adult height. According to the information he quotes, these measurements are closely related to the amount of sugar in the diet. Here are some of his examples. The birth weight of babies in Basel, Switzerland, increased from an average of 3.1 kilograms to 3.3 kilograms between the years 1900 and 1960, except during the two world wars when it decreased. These changes parallel the changes in sugar consumption. In Oslo, the height of girls between 8 and 14 years old increased between 1920 and 1950. For 14 year old girls, the increase was more than 4 inches. The only interruption to this trend was during the Second World War. Again, these changes in height were parallel to the changes in sugar consumption. Also, in Norway, the height of adult men increased by about three-quarters of an inch between 1835 and 1870, and by another one and a half inches between 1870 and 1930. The average yearly sugar intake increased from two and a quarter pounds in 1835 to 11 pounds in 1875, and to 67 pounds in 1937. Current consumption is over 90 pounds, an increase of 40-fold over a period of about 150 years. So far, I have mentioned only the effect of sugar on the gain of height and weight in children.
or of weight in experimental animals. Analysis of the bodies of the experimental animals often shows changes in the amount of fat, as I have said, and also changes in the size and compositions of some of the organs. In our experiments with rats, we have mostly found a moderate decrease in the amount of body fat. In one experiment, from 35% of the dry weight of the animal to 30%. On the other hand, some workers have shown an increase in body fat, for example in baboons. This is probably no real contradiction. There is reason to believe that the exact effect of sugar depends on the species of animals you study or even on the particular strain of species, such as rats. It also depends on the age when sugar feeding begins, on whether you are studying male or female animals, and on how long the experiment continues. Sugar's Effect on Maturity one of the features of affluent countries is the nutritional state of their babies and young children. No longer is there the incidence of nutritional deficiency such as one used to see, the pinched, starved, rickety children that were common in the larger cities. Instead, there is an appreciable number of fat children, many of them beginning to acquire, even well before they are a year old, the condition that will later turn into years of struggle against fat. One of the characteristics of these overweight babies and children is that their growth in height is accelerated as well, and they tend to reach maturity early. Although few detailed statistics exist, it is agreed that obesity occurs in bottle-fed babies much more commonly than in the breastfed. A paper in the British Medical Journal, Lancet, suggested that this happens because of the early introduction of mixed feeding, especially of cereals. What is overlooked is that a common formula for the bottle-fed baby is a powder consisting of, or largely based on, dried cow's milk, to which ordinary sugar is added. It is also usual to add sugar to the cereal feed when it is begun and indeed quite common to add sugar to other foods as they are introduced, even to egg and minced meat and vegetables. Many of the canned baby foods that are now so commonly used also contain added sugar, and this applies not only to puddings and sweets, but also to many savoury foods. It is good to see, however, that an increasing number of manufacturers now produce at least some sugar-free baby foods. All this points to the possible role of sugar in producing childhood obesity, but there is now evidence that sugar may also produce other effects in children. One of the very remarkable changes that has occurred in human physiology during the last century is the reduction in the age when boys and girls reach maturity. Because it is easier to detect maturity in girls than in boys, by the date when menstruation begins, more information exists about girls, but studies do show earlier maturity also in boys. Briefly, each decade has seen a decrease of some three or four months in the age at which puberty begins. In the past 130 years, the age at which Norwegian girls have reached puberty has fallen by almost exactly four years, from an average of 17 years to an average of 13 years. The same trends can be seen in Sweden, England and the United States. In 1905, the average age of puberty in American girls was 14 years and three months. Today it is just about 12 years. Incidentally, it is quite wrong to think that puberty occurs early in the tropics. It occurs, in fact, much later in the better-off countries in temperate climates. The usual explanation of earlier maturation is that it is caused by better nutrition in the wealthier countries and by fewer attacks during childhood from infectious and other diseases. But Dr. Siegler has suggested 
with a wealth of statistics that the main cause is an increase in sugar intake. He believes that earlier sexual maturity is part of the total acceleration of growth that sugar induces. Although he has no experimental evidence, he produces a very plausible explanation in terms of the probable effects of sugar on hormonal secretion. I shall discuss this later in some detail. In our own experimental work, we have made three observations that support the suggestion that sugar results in early sex maturity. When treating cockerels with sugar diets, we have noticed that their combs become red and enlarged earlier than those of cockerels fed diets without sugar. At the end of one of our experiments, we found that the testes were distinctly larger in the cockerels fed sugar. With pigs, those receiving sugar were seen to be sexually more active, as shown by their frequent attempts to mount one another in the pen. In rats, sugar produces a distinct increase in the size of the adrenal glands, which, among other functions, produce hormones affecting sex development. In support of Dr. Ziegler's finding is a report by Dr. O. Schaefer of Canada. The particular interest of this study is that there has been a large increase in sugar consumption among the Eskimos in the Canadian North. Dr. Schaefer studied Eskimos in three areas and measured birth weights as well as the heights and weights of adults and children at various ages. In one of the areas, the average annual sugar consumption had increased from 26 pounds to 104 pounds in eight years. In a second area, from 83 pounds to 111 pounds in one year, and in a third area, from 46 pounds to 61 pounds over five years. Birth weights increased in all of these areas. A small increase with the smallest rise in sugar consumption, and a larger increase amounting to between half a pound and a pound in one year in the other areas. Between 1938 and 1968, the stature of adult men increased by nearly two inches, and that of women by just over one inch. The height of the children increased much more. Boys and girls aged between two and ten years were two inches to three inches taller. Boys of eleven were four and a half inches taller, and girls of twelve or thirteen were as much as eight inches taller. The latter change was accompanied by a lowering of the age at which there was the rapid weight gain associated with puberty. In 1968, this occurred between the ages of 11 and a half and 13, while in 1938, it had occurred between the ages of 13 and a half and 15. The Eskimos appear to show a similar but perhaps even more rapid advance of puberty to that which had occurred in Western Europe and America. The increased growth of children, and especially the earlier development of puberty, is generally assumed to be due to an improvement in nutrition, notably an increase in the intake of protein. This was the explanation given for the considerable increase in the growth of Japanese school children since the Second World War. In fact, however, while the intake of animal protein doubled, the intake of total protein was only 10% more, and there is little evidence that the children measured in 1946 were deficient in protein. The role of protein is even less likely when you consider that intake among the Eskimos had in fact fallen from over 300 grams a day to just over 100 grams a day during the period that Dr. Schaefer studied. There was also a substantial fall in the protein intake of Icelanders, one of the groups studied by Dr. Ziegler. On the other hand, in all these three examples, the Japanese, the Eskimos, and the Icelanders, the acceleration of growth was associated with a great rise in sugar intake. Sugar's Effect on Longevity Most of our experiments with animals were carried out for a relatively short time, 
and began with quite young animals, often only a few weeks old. We have had little experience, therefore, in gauging the effects of different diets on the lifespan of rats or cockerels or pigs or rabbits. We did, however, keep one simple experiment going much longer than usual, beginning with twenty-eight rats one month old. Of these, fourteen were given a diet without sugar and fourteen a diet with sugar. At the end of two years, we had eight rats alive in the starch group and only three alive in the sugar group. More careful observations have been made by two other groups of research workers. One group in Holland fed some rats with a mixture of foods representing the average Dutch diet and compared them with other rats that were fed the same mixture but with twice as much sugar. I should add that the amount of sugar in the Dutch diet supplies about 15.5% of the calories, slightly less than the 16% or so in the average American diet and the 18% or so in the British diet. One of the male rats, those fed the standard diet, survived an average of 566 days. Those fed extra sugar, an average of 486 days. The survival time for female rats was 607 days, as against 582 days. If the same proportional reduction in lifespan occurred in human beings, the extra sugar would result in the biblical three score years and ten being reduced to about sixty years for men and to sixty seven years for women. The greater resistance of the female animals to sugar is another matter I shall discuss later. The second study on longevity was carried out by some American workers from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The diets were made up so as to contain either starch or sugar as the carbohydrate component. The investigators studied two strains of rats and, as I have mentioned, found that the strains responded differently to diets containing sugar. One lived just as long with either sugar or starch, although the sugar produced larger livers containing more fat. The other strain also had larger livers with more fat when they were fed sugar. In addition, however, their kidneys were enlarged and the rats died substantially earlier, at 444 days instead of the 595 days of the starch-fed rats. If you again take the longer survival period as equivalent to 70 years for a human being, the lifespan with a sugar-rich diet was reduced to the equivalent of 51 years. There is no evidence at present that sugar affects the lifespan of human beings, but in the light of this animal research, it would not be an entirely absurd suggestion. One keeps hearing how much healthier people are now in the wealthy countries because of improvements in nutrition and the reduction of infectious diseases. As a result, it is reported the average expectation of life has risen from about 40 years a century ago to over 70 years now. But the former low average expectation of life was due largely to a high mortality in babies and young children. Once people reached the age of 25 or so, they were likely to survive to almost the same age as Westerners do now. This is in spite of all the advances in nutrition and medicine and hygiene, so it is reasonable to suppose that these improvements in health have been at least partly offset by some deterioration that holds back what otherwise might have been a slight but very real increase in lifespan. The sugar might affect growth, maturation and longevity, is only astonishing if one continues to believe that all dietary carbohydrates have the same metabolic effect once they have been digested and absorbed. It not only ceases to be astonishing, but becomes highly plausible when one remembers that sugar can induce sizable alterations in the level of potent hormones.